these birds are really secretive. It's winter. They're not responding to callbacks or anything like that. So we have to kind of push them into our nets. One in. Sweet. Oh, there's another one. Souls? On banded souls. All right, little buddy. Salt marsh sparrows are super hard to find because they're essentially the same color as the grass and the marsh. Orange, brown, tan colored birds, medium sized sparrow, but with fairly large bills. Really adorable. And quiet. In the summertime, they'll call and sing. Really, we just hear them making like small vocalizations during the winter. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> ah! These tiny birds may soon be considered endangered. They rely on coastal marsh ecosystems to thrive and spend their winters in North Carolina's salt marshes, the same marshes that humans depend on as a buffer against the sea. But those marshes are disappearing. So salt marsh sparrows ranges from Maine down to Virginia about for breeding and then Virginia down to Florida for non-breeding. So we only have a wintering population here. Their populations have been declining about 9% a year since 1998 and that trend hasn't seen to subside at all due to forces such as sea level rise, marsh loss, marsh restrictions, how big your marsh is. Listing them for the Endangered Species Act has been delayed to 2023. So getting as much information about where they're at right now is really important for that potential listing. Their population decline is an indicator of their habitat being squeezed out of existence as marshes get pushed up against hardened surfaces by sea level rise. And salt marshes aren't just a home for sparrows. They do a lot of important things on the coast. So many things. So many reasons. Food, carbon sinks, so yeah. storm protection, flooding protection. They do everything. <laughs> yeah. They're a buffer before our coastline. So it's like really important to have that good buffer of marsh to really protect your coastline and provide habitat for multiple species. This marsh buffer is made up of plants that are uniquely adapted to thrive in soggy, salty conditions. Marsh can be defined by the amount of time in a year that the soil is wet or moist and whether it's anoxic or lacking oxygen. And as you can see around us, we have a lot of spiky vegetation here. Marsh elevation is like really relevant to what plants grow where. So right now we're surrounded by this spiky juncus, uh, but farther out, the deeper you get, the closer you get to the water, you're gonna see a different breakdown of plant species. And that's because certain plant species are more tolerant to constant inundation and salt water. But even marsh plants have their limits. High water levels can actually drown a marsh if the soil never dries out. Researchers like Murray and Evan are collecting data to figure out how marshes will be impacted as sea levels continue to rise. It's a very small elevation gradient that leads to these different plant communities. If this water comes up even a little more for a long period of time, this juncus is gonna turn into Spartina. The juncus is gonna go away because that's a slightly higher elevation plant species. In the past, marshes adapted to sea level rise by moving inland to higher ground. But today, there's nowhere for them to go. We're hardening our coastlines, we're shortening our marshes, we're seeing a lot of coastal squeeze, so we have a development or a road or something and that marsh has nowhere else it can go, so it gets squeezed and squeezed and squeezed landward until that marsh just disappears. There's a lot of population growth along the coast, so those trends are not looking to turn in the opposite direction. We need to plan ahead for these things, both for like human infrastructure, but also for like ecosystem services to be able to migrate inland. And right now we're not doing that. By gathering data about things like tides, elevation, and sea level rise, researchers like Murray can use models to predict what will happen in the future. Sea level rise has gone up and down for forever, but it's at an accelerated pace right now, which is why we think we're having more inundation than we would if it was just at a steady rise, instead it's rising exponentially. Modeling can help us see where we're gonna be most impacted, so where on each site is gonna be most impacted by water inundation. With that, we're able to hopefully target where we can do specific management strategies. Learning more about what's happening to species like the salt marsh sparrow can help us make decisions now to ensure that there are marshes along the coast in the future. If 
we see that certain huge portions of the marshland that they depend on during the winter are disappearing, then we have to decide, okay, well, we have this much property. If we're expecting to lose this percentage of it, where are those marshes gonna go? Are they going to migrate in? Should we start looking at acquiring property to make sure that this species has a place to move? Where do you put your resources? Do you put it in buying land? Do you put it at trying to conserve that marsh by building it up some more? Like, those are some of the questions we're trying to help managers answer. If we can create this framework of understanding the impact of sea level rise and where this marsh might disappear or where it might go, we can hopefully help these managers make decisions for that.